Hello, I'm Robert Lomas, and this is the tenth of seventeen episodes of a work called Ten Nights in the Black Lion, which was written by the novelist Daniel Owen in 1859. It was originally written as a serial in a magazine called Charles Abala, which was produced by his friend Nathaniel Jones. But Nathaniel had tendered his resignation as editor and was soon to be replaced by the Reverend John Davis. This is the last episode which Nathaniel Jones edited, and it's the tenth episode that was published on July 28, 1859. Episode 10, The Fifth Evening The meal I was served that evening was completely different to the one I had had on my first visit to the Black Lion. The tablecloth was filthy, foul and dirty. The dishes, cups and cutlery stuck to my hands with dirt, and the food was of such a quality that I stopped eating after only a few bites. The husband and wife of the inn were not at the table, but at least two dissonant and noisy Irishmen shared the repast. I had been hungry when the bell was rung to call me to supper, but my enthusiasm quickly waned in the diseased air of the dining room, and I was the first to leave the table. Soon afterwards the oil lamps were lit. A few regulars started to gather in the spacious bar room, where there was comfortable seating, tables, newspapers, backgammon boards and dominoes, etc. Almost everyone would demand a glass of liquor as they arrived, and they would then drink two or three in the next hour, with the encouragement of kite newcomers. Most of those who made up this company were strangers to me, I was looking from face to face to see if any of the old assembly were present, when I noticed someone that I thought I recognised. I was studying him in detail to try to identify him, when somebody greeted him as Judge. Although his face had changed greatly, I realised it was Judge Lyman. Five years had significantly altered him. His face was much thickened and had lost all its radiance. It was so puffy that his eyes seemed to have sunk deep into folds of flesh, so deep that he seemed to have lost them. The swollen lips, the heavy eyelids, and the half-closed, weary, roomy eyes testified to his doleful state. But his voice was as loud, arrogant, and assertive as ever, and most of the time he didn't seem to make much use of his mind. He seemed animalistic in his shoddiness, even though I had heard that he had just been elected to the U.S. Congress as an anti-temperance champion with a large majority. He had stood as the champion of the rum, and of course everyone who loved that liquor had turned out to vote for him. Despite the fact he was set on trampling on all the virtues and morals of the place that had elected him, the voters had made him a national legislator and sent him up to the Congress to oppose any form of Prohibition Act. I marvelled at whom these Americans had elected as their representative and selected as a perfect example of their principles and their status as a state. A group quickly gathered around the judge. He was aggressively attacking the Temperance Party, which had opposed him for the previous two years. But I knew that at the last election it had greatly increased in popularity with the people. During that election they had published a paper which exposed the judge's personal character and moral principles in a most revealing and blatant way. This had affected his reputation in the eyes of those whose opinion he valued, and he had responded by accusing any man who pleaded the cause of temperance to be full of treacherous hypocrisy and to harbour a deep desire to curtail people's liberty. The next thing they will do, he said, raising his voice like a monster's roar, will be to pass laws to fine a man for taking a mouthful of tobacco or lighting a pipe. Touch the freedom of the people in the smallest things, and you will inevitably curtail the practice of the greater things. The Stamp Act against which our brave forefathers fought was only a mild repression of our fellowship, compared to what these fools want to carry out. An obnoxious man with a harsh voice spoke up. He had a case of hiccups, which seemed to punctuate every other word from his throat. You must repeat that in the Congress, Lyman. Hic! You're right for once in your life if you've never been right before. Hic! He said. Everybody knows what they really are. That's hic, my great uncle Josh, who hic, has been keeping the poorhouse for ten years. Well, their tight want to knock it down and turn it into a road if they get the upper hand around here. If? That word means a lot, Harry, said the judge. We mustn't let them get the upper hand. 
Every man has a duty to deliver for his country in this matter, and every man must do his duty. But what do they have against your Uncle Joshua? What has he done to offend this sanctimonious and godly party? They don't have anything against him, I think. But they say there won't be any need for a poor house in the country at all. What? They want to turn the inmates out to starve, shouted another fellow. Oh no, said the hiccuping creature, shrieking powerfully in an attempt to overcome his affliction. No, not so. They claim if they carry the deck, the door her poor... The poor house won't be needed. At least so they say. And I think there's something in it too. I saw no one that had to go to the poor, <coughs> poor house who hadn't been driven by the rum making them poor. But I want to keep the poor house going, don't you see? <coughs> because I am walking the flat road of life. And I wouldn't like to come to the last mile so <coughs> without a place to call in. And perhaps I might lead it like my Uncle Josh. If I had a vote in America, you would be sure to benefit it come the next election, he said joyfully beating the judges back. Goodbye to the rum drinkers. That's the ticket. Hey! Harry Graves doesn't deny his friends. I'm as strong as steel. You are a trump, said the judge in a homely tone. Fear not about the poor house and your Uncle Josh. They'll be safe. But look here, the man added. It's not just hey! the poor house, but the jail hey! that's going to be next. How is that true? Well, that's what they say. I think they're not far off either. What's driving people to the jail? You know something about that, Judge, because you've done a lot of judging in your time. <coughs> Weren't they all sent there after drinking rum? <coughs> the judge decided not to comment. Well, <coughs> silence is saying something, said Grimes. And they also say that if they get the upper hand, judges and lawyers won't be needed any more. And they'll have to get some other business or starve. So, <coughs> you'll see, you'll have to fight for it. Or lose your livelihood. It was obvious that the judge didn't like what the man was saying, but he was too much a politician to show it. Harry Grimes's vote was of equal value to that of the best of men, and one vote could sometimes strike the balance in an election, and so Judge Lyman tried never to upset a voter. I hear their reasoning, Judge Lyman said, laughing, but I'm far too long in the tooth to believe such claims. Poverty and crime always start in the corrupted heart of a man before the first step is taken in the way of drunkenness and greed. Few look at the facts and trace them into their causes. Rum and destruction? Aren't they cause and effect? asked Grimes. Yes, but only sometimes, was Lyman's ridiculous reply. Oh, Green, there you are, shouted the judge as Harvey Green came in, to the general approval of the company. Lyman took the chance to get away from his talkative, hiccuping friend. I looked at Green and read his face in detail. He hadn't changed much. I saw the same evil eyes, the same savage mouth, the same false smile. Everything suggested he had the same evil, deceptive heart, too. If he had drunk heavily during the last few years, it hadn't contaminated his blood or changed anything in his face. Did you see anything of young Hammond tonight? asked Judge Lyman. I saw him about an hour or two ago, replied Green. Was he going to drive his new horse? Oh, yes, he's mad about it. What did it cost? Sixty pounds. Truly? The judge got up, and Green and he walked side by side across the barroom floor. I want a word with you, I heard the judge say as the two went out together. I saw no more of them that night. Shortly afterwards, Willie Hammond came in. Ah, he too had undergone a considerable transformation, just as Matthew the barkeeper had said. He went up to the bar, and I heard him ask us for Judge Lyman. Matthew's answer was so low that I couldn't hear it. Hammond pointed to the decanters on the shelf behind Matthew, who plonked one down in front of him. From it he poured half a tumblerful and drank it down, unmixed, with no leavening of water. He showed considerable mental agitation and asked several questions, which I couldn't hear. When Matthew answered, he directed his eyes upwards, as if he were indicating a room in the house. Willie hurried off to the implied room. "'What's the matter with Willie Hammond tonight? one man asked the barkeeper. "'What is he after in such a hurry?' "'He wants to see Judge Lyman,' replied Matthew. "'Oh, not much good in that, then,' another remarked. "'No, not much, I'm afraid.' At this point, two well-dressed young gentlemen, obviously from good local families, came in. 
They took a drink at the bar before speaking quietly to Matthew. Then they went through the door leading up to the previously indicated room. I looked at the man with whom I had been speaking in the porch earlier in the afternoon. He gave me an insightful wink to recall his remarks that gambling was going on in one of the upper rooms. It was a nightmare, and some of the town's most promising young men were drowning in this terrible lake. I felt my blood run cold as I contemplated it. The talk in the bar room was becoming crude and debased, so I left to sit outside. The sky was clear, the breeze balmy, and the moon shining bright. I stood for a while in the porch, reflecting on what I had seen and heard, watching a stream of visitors pour into the bar room. Only a few stayed there. Most of them downed their glasses hurriedly and came out, so that no one would be likely to see them. Shortly afterwards, while I still stood in the porch, I noticed an old lady walk slowly past. She dawdled a while, trying to see through the bar room door. She stayed only a moment, but in less than ten minutes she returned and waited a little longer, before again moving away. Then she disappeared. I wondered what she was doing. Then I saw her again approach along the road, for this time she came closer to the pub doorway. I was disturbed to see her return yet again. I was now sure this was a distressed mother looking for her son, a son who was walking down a dangerous path. She saw me watching and walked slowly on, looking fearful and afraid. But then, as if unable to stop herself, she came back yet again. This time she came close enough to the door of the house to see into every corner of the bar room. She seemed content with this inspection and hurried away. I did not see her return again that evening. Ah, I thought, this is a clear sign of this pub's damning influence. My heart was broken thinking about what this unrecognised mother was suffering and what she had to endure. I couldn't get it out of my mind as I lay on my bed that night. It troubled even my dreams. That's the end of the tenth episode of Ten Nights in the Black Lion, written by Daniel Owen. It was first published in the magazine Charles Abala on July 28, 1859. I'm Robert Lomas, and I spent the last year translating this. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please click the subscribe box in the bottom right hand corner of the screen.